That's it. Here we go. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for April's webinar. I can't even believe where the time is going. It is insane. Um, our speaker today is uh, Mike Addison. I'm sure that he needs no introduction <coughs> amongst us. I am going to ask that if you um, have your uh, microphone unmuted and there is some background noise on your side, if you don't mind muting yourself, you're more than welcome to participate and unmute and raise your hand and all of those fun things. But just in case there's some background noise, please do mute yourself. Um, good morning to everyone joining. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Carl and Carl's going to do a couple of announcements. And then we're going to hand over directly to Mike. You've got his slides up there. Um, yeah, Carl, over to you. Thanks, Linda. Good morning, everyone. I hope that you are all doing well. And thank you so much for tuning into our webinar this morning. Okay. This webinar will be recorded and published on our YouTube channel. So please remember to like and subscribe to us. You can also turn on um, post notifications to be notified the moment, the moment that this recording um, will become available, as well as any other time that we post on YouTube. <clears throat> uh, then if you haven't, please do sign up to our newsletter. This way you'll be able to keep in touch with, um, with the TVDM consultants team. Then TVDM Table Talks live discussion will be happening this Friday at 9 a.m. This is a great opportunity to ask our consultants any community schemes related questions. Yeah, I'm fine, man. Uh, uh, everything that... schemes face in 2024. I... Ladies, Jay, if you get some background noise, please do mute yourself. Thank you. Please note that this feature is only available to our paid for members. Um, and if you'd like to up upgrade your current package, please reach out to me. Then please make sure um, to check out the Let's Get Physical event dates for this year. They have been posted on social media as well as on our neighborhood in our industry events calendar. So I'll add the link below in the, in the comment section for that. Then we will also be out of office next week, Friday for a team event at a new client scheme. Then also please keep a lookout for our new internal dispute resolution service. We will be launching this new service, this new service offering very soon. So that's all the announcements that I have for today. Um, I'm going to hand over to Mike now. <clears throat> right. Should we get going? Um, Zalinda, how many minutes do I have? Um, You've I wasn't got sure. You've got a full hour, so we've got about fifty. Oh seconds. no, we'll yeah, finish. We'll it. finish before. We'll finish before <laughs> then. We we can go on and on, but um, I've I think we must try and keep it on on a certain line today. Okay, so good morning, everybody, and Zelinda, Kyle, and team. Thank you so much for inviting us. I'm, I'm always honoured to be on your webinars. Really great to be here. Um, and thank you, everybody. There's so many of you come to listen to what we have to say this morning. So um, obviously it's passionate um, or means quite a lot to me, uh, the subject. Um, I've been working obviously with a lot of changes and a lot of concerns over the last few months. In fact, the last year or so <clears throat> since the underwriting managers started telling me stuff and I've been attending quite a few seminars on insurance and of course, um, uh, there are things that are coming, um, different attitudes by insurers. I think what we need to do is not doom and gloom. I'm not here to try and scare you or to tell you stuff that's going to worry you more. I think this morning's idea is, and I've got, picked out a few of the points with a view to what do we do about the environment, the risks that we face in 2024. I think that's the way we've got to do it. Well, this might happen, so let's just see how we can best protect ourselves all around from managing agents, trustees, and for owners ultimately. Okay, so here goes. So just to paint the background picture, um, uh, probably just over a year ago, about February last year, I remember uh, one of the largest insurers, Santam, came along to us and said, and Santam, by the way, are the insurers that we always rely on as being the guys that can do the big buildings for us if we've got a problem. And they came to us to say that their wings had been clipped by the international reinsurers and that they are going to start having a problem with some of the larger risks. Now, that's very concerning. So here we are, uh, 
specializing in sectional title insurance, and we might not be able to do a very large building ourselves. And likewise, obviously, our competitors or our friends in the industry. Um, but more importantly, um, what about a poor owner who's in a large scheme um, and now suddenly they can't have insurance? So these were the concerns that we were starting to pick up last year. And, and of course, the environment got tougher. So what do I mean by the environment tougher from an insurance point of view? And, um, you know, what had happened was leading up to that was there had been KZN riots. I'm sure that's still fresh in your mind, the unrest in KZN at the time. And then very closely on its back or just before it was the KZN floods. Let's not forget the KZN floods. They were severe and the insurance company took a real beating there. Um, changing weather patterns are a, are a huge concern internationally. It's not just here, but you must remember insurers reinsure. So if there's a huge flood in another country, you know, we, we're actually paying a little bit towards that uh, by way of our reinsurance part of the premium. For those who don't understand, we insure with insurance companies and then insurance companies reinsure with reinsurers. So reinsurance is a pretty important element of a premium. Um, and if it's, if it's reinsured and the reinsurer charges more, the, it's nothing our insurance company can do about it. Uh, they have to actually take that and pass that on. Then you've got, and I'm, I'm speaking very much in layman's terms. Um, if I got hold of uh, some of the underwriting managers or if they're listening to me, they'll probably think I'm doing baby talk here, but I think let's rather keep the discussions for everybody to understand. I'm not going to try and impress you with any lingo. Um, and then, of course, um, let's, you know, we thought, oh, let's hold our thumbs and hopefully we get through this. And then on the 13th of November last year, we had huge storms in Johannesburg. I think Cape Town recently are still licking their wounds this week from last week's storms uh, in some of the areas. We've got crumbling infrastructure. Now, that's a major concern uh, on the international front. Um, you know, we've got roads. I mean, perhaps I see them more than you guys do in Cape Town and KZN, but in Johannesburg, you've got areas where you, know, you can just see when the road when it rains, that water's not going to go down that drain. There's just no way. It's, you know, it's first got to go through a forest. Um, and, you know, when roads flood, then complexes flood, and so it gets worse. I mean, I'm dealing with one at the moment where the wall was undermined because the road flooded. You know, it's just... Um, it's it, it impacts heavily. And, you know, there's the infrastructure is not taking away the water. And, of course, there's more water. And then, just to crown it all, we've got elections coming up. Uh, so, I mean, if you were a guy sitting in London deciding whether to invest a couple of billion in South Africa, I don't know, would you, you be scratching your head? So, um, that's the background. Okay. So, that's the boring part. Okay. So, not to, not to be negative, but to understand that that is a risk. These are the risks that other people look at. Another interesting thing, when we attend these um, training sessions for brokers, call it, uh, or webinars or seminars for brokers, we try and soak up what's happening, of course, ourselves, just like you are here. Um, but from our point of view, what was quite interesting, I remember, I think it was Bright, the underwriter manager for Bright, the underwriting manager for Bright, was telling us that the um, reinsurers are having a look or taking a look at where there's a dam upstream. Now, just to give you an idea, he was saying something along the lines, and this is now secondhand news, so bear with me. You know, in Libya, two dams broke or a dam broke and flooded a whole city type of thing um, uh, last year or the year before and this dam collapsed and came down flooding everywhere and it made the international people start looking at dams and bearing in mind that dams even the hoover dam was built in the u.s in about 1930 something all these dams are more than 70 years old not all of them but lots of dams are more than 70 years old and concrete and so on has a certain lifespan and of course, now it, the, the, the pressure is on with more water coming down these rivers. So there's a view being taken as to whether there's a dam upstream and, you know, what's downstream. Uh, 
And, um, you know, I don't, I'm not saying it is the case, but I'm battling to insure stuff on the Vol River <laughs> downstream, and I'm battling um, with other things. So just to give you an idea of how the international market, some dam that breaks in Libya has everybody thinking, and then it impacts on us here in South Africa. Okay, so let's go through the points. Okay, so number one, higher claims equals higher premiums. Doesn't that make sense? Yes, but there's a big story. So it's all very well for a broker to say to you, oh, um, here's your premium increase, but why? And my biggest challenge at the moment, and, and you, you'd think that you'd be dealing with people that are you know, ignorant or haven't been well educated, not at all. I'm actually finding more of a challenge from well, you know, well-versed, educated business people who are challenging premium increases at the moment. Now, why is that? Is because everybody's trying to keep their budget intact, because nobody wants to actually go to their clients at this. Oh, so sorry, their owners at this point and say you've got you know a thirty percent. Everybody's trying to keep like below ten percent increase in levies, and insurance is pushing up. Um, but I think I'm going to spend some time on this, probably most of the time, explaining a concept. And I'm going to appeal to managing agents and trustees, but particularly managing agents, to try and get your trustees to understand the concept of claims ratio. It sounds like obvious, but it's not as obvious as you think. And once you understand it, you will they will get it. They will get it. So what the biggest danger that I'm seeing, and I've seen it twice now in the last week. A, 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 very typically, a building's running at, you know, maybe they're paying 10,000 rand a month premium or whatever the case might be. And somebody comes along and says, I can do that for you for 8,000 rand. So the trustee's perception is they must just get the same cover, but they must get the cheapest premium. Now, that sounds logical, but it's actually wrong. I'll tell you why is when the short answer, and then I'm going to explain, and then I'll repeat it, uh, and you'll understand what I'm saying. So the cheaper premium could be putting the body corporate at huge risk. Now, I can see when it is and when it isn't. So let's say your premium, your, your, your claims ratio is running at 100%. Then somebody comes and offers you a 20% discount. It's then pushing your claims ratio to 120%. If that claims ratio doesn't get better, the insurer that's taken over the policy is likely to cancel the policy, give you 30 days notice to cancel because it's now not sustainable. Okay, I call it reckless underwriting. And then the body corporate sits without insurance 30 days later and then they're crying and want to go back to the old insurers who all are saying oh no your claims ratio is too high okay so then they sit without insurance that's the big danger of that now i'm going to explain okay so you've got to understand what is claims ratio so claims ratio is very simple actually it's not complicated. It sounds ratio. Oh, my goodness, math class ratios or oh, graphs. Um, it's not. It's actually very, very simple. Your premium for every 100 rand of premium that is coming in to the insurance company. Okay. 100 rand comes into the insurance company. 60% of that premium pays claims. Not 100%, 60%. I spoke about reinsurance just now. So some of that money goes to reinsurance. Some of the money goes to pay me uh, so that I can sit here and explain this stuff to you. Some of the money goes to the insurance company staff because obviously if you submit a claim, somebody's going to deal with it for you on the other side and so on. And they've got quite a bit of expertise. And of course, their buildings, their rent, their IT, everything gets paid out of the 40%. Okay, so all costs to the policy of your 100 Rand premium, you could say 40% goes to costs and 60% to pay claims. So you can see that the insurance company are breaking even at 
So in other words, if your policy for, for, if for every 60 rand that they pay out in claims for you, okay, you are actually at 100%. In other words, they're running at a loss if they pay 70% claims ratio. If they're paying out 70 rand for every 100 rand that they receive, they're running at a 10% loss. Okay, so I don't have an audience in front of me, so I can't have anybody to understand, not your heads or anything. So I'm hoping that uh, you are understanding. Okay. So then we look at the, 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 the where does this put a body corporate? Okay, so just to repeat, 100 Rand premium for every 100 Rand premium, the insurance company are paying out 50 Rand. That's a 50% claims ratio. For every 100 Rand that they receive and they're paying out 30 Rand, it's a 30% claims ratio. The right premium, so in other words, for a managing agent or a trustee, if you look at your policy, all you have to do is to look at your claims history, which shows your claims ratio. If your claims ratio is running between 35% and 55%, your premium is correct. That's the general way of looking at it. If, you're, if it's consistently at 35%, there's probably space for a bit of discount. And your broker should be saying, come guys, can we get a 10% discount or no increase this year? If it's running at 55%, you're heading towards the danger zone um, where your policies start to become unsustainable. Now, there's two ways that uh, I always say there's two blunt tools that the insurance company has to manage a premium and claims ratio, and that is excess. In other words, they can put an excess on the policy. Let's just say they put 100,000 Rand excess for any claim. They're not paying anything below 100,000. You can see the claim ratio is going to go down very fast. Um, so what they generally do, they look for where the shoe is hurting, and they might say, oh, the geezers are the problem, and therefore we're going to put a higher excess on geezers. My geezer, your geezer excess is now 3,000 Rand um, per geezer claim. And that's how they manage it. And then... Um, or storm damage. And that's what I'm going to speak about just now. Okay, so I'm not, not going to harbor on that. Between 35 and 55% is your comfort. But I thought what I'd do is I'd just show you an example. I like um, CIAs, and I think it's Grail. Uh, it's, so some of the other insurance companies have got similar format claims history. Mike, can I interrupt you there for yes. one second? Yeah. Um, yes, please. Andres, I see Andres's hand is raised. I know we don't normally take uh, comments and stuff during, but I think it is a rather complicated um, topic. So perhaps we can just stop there mm. for a minute. Andres, you mm. can unmute yourself. Oh, thank you, guys. Uh, Mike, just a quick question. The 50% that you're referring to as a claim ratio, is that 50% of 100% or 50% of a 60%? No, good question. 50% uh, of the 100%. That's why... Um, I say that when it goes past, if you look at this picture, if it goes past the 55%, you're starting to go into 60%. Uh, and that is where the insurance company is starting to run at a loss. If your premium, so just to color that in a little bit, if you look at 0 to 35%, the purple block there, actually, if your premium is in that block, you are paying too much premium in my view. Generally, very nice for the insurance company, very nice actually because you've got some fat in your policy, but um, uh, but there's definitely space then for a discount. Yeah. In other words, if you're running at 15% claims ratio consistently for three years in a row, um, you know, you should actually be able to halve your premium effectively within reason. Mm. Thanks. Makes well, sense, just, does it? Yeah, yeah. Just, just to confirm, so if you're basically running on 60%, you basically claiming that full sixty percent that they pay out on insurance. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. That's 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 what I want everybody to try and understand. Um, and here's the example, Andre. So, um, if you look at the top here, can you see that thirty eight comma eight seven percent? Okay. Then there's an on then there's a middle column. Um, there's uh, forty five point seven one percent, and then the last column is twenty seven point two four percent. Okay, so this is why I like this format because there's different ways of looking at claims history, but for the and and CIA break it down into three columns for you. So you've got the current policy year, which means if the current policy year is only been running for three months, 
you know, there will be a little bit of, it's it's not really a good view because you have one month premium and then you have a big clam. Okay, so, but I like it because it gives you, you know, especially 11 months down the line, it gives you a good indicator of which way the policy is going, you know, which way the wind is blowing. In this case, the premiums collected uh, for the year so far, 32,000 and then 8,900 8, have been paid out in claims so far this year. Okay, 27%. The last policy year, in other words, the last year, uh, which is an indicator of where we were most recently in a full 12 month period, 45%, 40, we'll call it 46% actually. Um, premiums collected 69,000, 31,000 odd paid out. But the important area, and this is the one that we say is more, most accurate, is since the inception of the policy. So CIA will actually go back until they incepted the policy. They don't know what happened before. But um, so this policy has been running, I uh, think, since about 2016. You can see first claim. This is the top uh, uh, column shows 2016. So I'll assume that this policy with CIA has been with CIA since about 2016, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, yeah, six years. So you know what? Um, uh, it's a nice period. So this policy is running correctly within the green belt um, at 38.87, call it 39%. You know, in the 40s is where I'm comfortable, actually. If it's in the 30s, I like to push the insurer. Our staff actually negotiate lower premiums, believe it or not. And then, um, you know, then we keep very quiet when it starts going higher. Okay. Now, I say that with tongue-in-cheek, I go very quiet when it goes higher because that's the problem. It's been, the problem is that everybody's been quiet about the higher premiums and we all hope, even the insurance company, oh, I hope this policy goes, gets better now. Um, and the problem is policies aren't getting better. So the insurance companies are clamping down. Okay, so what you're seeing um, is anybody who's got a policy with CIA, for example, at the moment in the last I say month. If your if your claims ratio was over eighty percent, you would have got a letter for a fifteen percent increase, roughly, or more. Okay, sound familiar? Okay, I can't, I wish I had people nodding their heads and I could see, but I, I would tell you now that the largest managing agents out there, if you've got you know, or a portfolio manager, if you've got thirty buildings, you'll have some of them will be with CIA. Some of them will have 120% claims ratio, so they're getting an increase. They've got a letter, 30 days, we're increasing or we're changing terms and we're going to increase your excess and they're going to... Sounds like they're being horrible, but they're not. Okay. Preserve that policy. Get the ratios right. Okay. Now, what I did last year, I, I prepared up again, it's you, to try and ask a trustee to go and watch a half an hour video is just too much. Okay, so I've compressed what I've just told you. Part one of claims ratio is literally nine minutes or 10 minutes long, okay? And it's compressed and I've spoken as fast as I could. And then claims ratio part two uh, is five minutes and it's what I've just shown you now. It's that same example, those are the same diagrams. Now, I urge you, if one of your trustees complain bitterly and tell you, ah, portfolio manager, this insurance company is really horrible, they're increasing our premium. First of all, you stick with CIA because they're one of the best. If you're with CIA, don't go jumping around. Big mistake. Okay. And then try and get your broker to help you manage that policy right to the degree that you can because there are some things you can do. Okay. So, and even if you show that you're doing it, the insurance company like that, okay, and can be helpful sometimes. But I urge them to go to the AdSure or get hold of these links, go to our, our, our YouTube channel and use the links and pass them on to your client if you're trying to explain it to them. Um, people, we use this all the time. Okay, these two these two videos for our clients to watch. Not that they watch them. I've got one at the moment telling me, I haven't got time to watch your videos. So I've responded to say, well, I can then have to explain it to you. It's going to take me half an hour to explain it or 10 minutes video watch up to you. Okay, so sometimes you just have to tell your clients, listen, if you want to be a trustee, then either do the job or otherwise get out of there. Okay, right. Okay, so 
one of the, the, the sore points are obviously poor pressure points is your geysers. What can be done about geysers? Now, I understand. It doesn't mean you can ah, we just go to stainless steel geysers. You can't always just do that. Now, we all know in the past, um, we used to preach 10 years ago even, we used to preach, and I do still follow this general guide. If you've got a very, very good plumber and they're servicing your 50-unit complex and you can call them out on a Sunday afternoon because you're busy having a bra, now you don't as a managing agent feel like being disturbed and somebody phones you, ah, I've got a geezer problem, and your faithful guy will go out there on a Sunday afternoon and fix their geezer. He'll leave his bra to do that or a burst pipe or some niggle on site or the water's not working properly, or there's a burst in the car park or whatever. Now, when it comes to, and we think, and we always have thought, it's good to have not 10 different plumbers just working on the site, but to get a plumber and a relationship going with a good professional plumbing company that gets to know your site, wherever your points are, and you know help you with a plan to fix pipes on the long term, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and so on and so on. So you don't want to take away necessarily the geezers from that guy because that's his, I mean, that's the, that's the cream. So, you know, you are, you, you making that come out on a Sunday afternoon to do the horrible work. And then you give the cream of the work to a call center. I understand that. Okay. So it is a balance. Okay. So we've got to find a balance and where that happens, we, there are ways that we try and work it. Okay. We try and balance it. But by and large, what we are finding is a call center, and not all of them, but we have identified that particularly CIA's call center, the minute you move over from normal geezer replacements to a call center with CIA, the whole scenario changes because they have in-house plumbing and trusted uh, uh, plumbers on their panel and they've got an app before and after photos, full reports, etc. They're not just sending out some plumber. Okay. Now, before you will also remember, my clients will remember, I used to be dead against call centers actually because I used to just get nightmares. Uh, have people phoning me on Sunday to tell me that this plumber has arrived after they found the call center and, and he's actually a gate guy. You can even see it written on his bucky. It says gate repairs and now he's come to fix my geezer. No ways. So, and some guys arrived with no tools and then they went off and I said they'd be back tomorrow. So, you know, I hated call centers in the past, but they have really got much better and uh, particularly CIA, CIB uh, and a few others. Um, but um, yeah, what we found is that out of every hundred claims or call outs, so for every call out, hundred call outs, before call centers are used statistically, and we've been measuring it, about 30% of them were repairs and 70% of them were replacements. After the call center was implemented, it ch we changed it on its head. 70% were repairs and 30% were uh, replacements. Now, what does that mean? On admission by well-known plumbers that we work with, they will admit it. Well, if they're honest and they tell me and I don't record them and I give them a couple cup of whiskeys or something, they will admit that they will flip a geezer where possible because it's business. If they go out and they justify it, they go out to a site and the geezer is six years old, seven years old. And it's, I'm not going to mention the name of the product as well, I'll get sued. But particularly if it's a certain product and they look at this geezer and actually it really needs a new element because it's the call out was no hot water. So now it needs a new element. And they look at this geezer. And they say, look, it's maybe within the next year, I'll be back here to replace it. And what they do is they say, burst geezer, and they replace the geezer. Okay, so that, and it's justified because actually it's probably possible that they will be back within the next year. So now you've got two call-outs instead of one. So they might as well change the geezer. 
insurance company is going to be changing at some time anyway. And that's the justification. You know, we can always justify why we need a new car or whatever, uh, <laughs> you know, um, but uh, it's not really the necessarily financially the case. And we found, um, we've actually done a video on it. You can actually go and watch it on our YouTube channel as well, on the stats that prove it on two large schemes. So proven stats, and that is a fact. So what I'm saying is you can, if you don't have that relationship plumber around, you can act, I would recommend strongly that you go towards a call center and watch the turnaround. Okay, there's one scheme I'm looking at at the moment, the scheme of, okay, so an interesting stat, by the way, <laughs> one of the underwriting managers, such a raw stat and such a raw way of looking at it. For every, what was it again? For every 14 geezers, I think he said, for every four, on average, this is just average, for every 14 geezers you have, you should have one popping a year. So if you're a scheme of 28, expect two geezers to pop a year. If 10 geezers are popping, there's something wrong. Okay, so that's a rough sort of stat. I, I quite enjoy that statistic. I use it all the time. Okay, now I've got an 88 scheme that um, the trustees jump up and down. And which understandably, because his premium went up 15% on about 200% claims loss ratio. But last year, 2023, 15 geezers were changed. Hmm. Okay, so yeah, we've got to, we're going to be looking at these things a little bit more closely. And I urge you to look at call centers, not necessarily stainless steel, but stainless steel is definitely a winner. Okay, we've also shown that we've got schemes that are moving over to stainless steel. We're seeing very little problem with them. They've got no anode. They don't need an anode. Anodes cost about, what, one or two grand to change per geezer. No anode. So already, even though that geezer costs 13,000 fully installed compared to 11 and a half fully installed, it's cheaper because one anode later, you're already winning. Okay, and then that geezer is going to be certainly... My ripe old age of 62, um, up, I'm putting a geezer in my place, by the way, um, even hasn't popped, but I'm putting one in, a stainless steel in, and I think that geezer is going to outlive me by a long, long shot. Okay, uh, enough about that. Then point number three um, is capacity. Okay, so capacity is a problem. Okay, and uh, this is one of the international problems from the picture I painted earlier on. So, um, painting that picture, the international guys say, whoa, South Africa. Uh, well, first of all, your premium is going to be more expensive to the insurance companies. And secondly, uh, we're not giving you a billion rand anymore, 800 million. We're going to clip you down to 500 million. Okay, just very typically. If a very large insurance company has only got 500 million capacity for reinsurance, that is it. If your building is being valued by Merfin for, or, or like that properties for uh, 700 million rand, uh, and it's all in one tower block, you've got a problem. Okay, you have got a big problem. Okay, there are sometimes ways around it. Um, but that's for your broker. That's what real good broking is all about. Your broker needs to try. It's not just a matter of sausage machine broking. You've got to actually, or order taking, you've got to actually go and really work out and see what you can do. Okay, I'm very proud. We, I don't. I think we've lost one building that we weren't able to insure out of all the buildings we do. Um, and we've made a plan with, with some of our others. No, two buildings, sorry, we couldn't insure. Uh, to very high-end uh, buildings, but um, yeah, we've uh, we've managed to insure. Now, what does this mean? Capacity. Capacity really means. Uh, um, funny, I, I was looking for a picture for capacity. That's why there's this uh, only this sort of uh, jigsaw puzzle thing saying capacity. <laughs> but the pictures that I could find on capacity were like batteries and things. Okay, so nothing to do with batteries. Uh, capacity here in the insurance means how much will a reinsurer, almost like a facility, will they give uh, an insurance company here in South Africa? So 
how much can an insurance company reinsure for maximum? Okay. Now, what what some trustees they get on the board of a large scheme of say 500 units or 1,000 units, and now there's a big cheese, and now they want to throw their weight around. I'm just this does happen, I promise you, and they oh, going to get a broker here to give us a best quote because we're a big building. We was a big premium. Well, actually, it's tougher than that. Okay, much tougher. In fact, I, I will tell you now, if you said to me, Mark, I've got a thousand unit building, I might say, well, stay with your broker. Then. Because I don't need to have the pressure of sleepless nights trying to find insurance for that building. I would rather not have the business. Okay, so it's it's really, really that tough. Um and capacity is a challenge. Okay. For the, our larger schemes, we work very, very hard. And keeping the building on cover with a high claims ratio is even more challenging, believe me. We had a 500 unit building that was given 30 days notice at the beginning of the year. Um, because the insurance companies, they want to gap it if they're running at a loss. They, 30 days notice, they're entitled to do that. Um, this is also what people don't understand. I had a trustee saying, he's going to the ombudsman. The insurance company can't cancel my insurance policy. Of course they can. They can actually cancel your policy if they don't like your face or your attitude. So you can, you can change. You can leave off and go off to another insurance company tomorrow. So likewise, they can say, we don't want to insure you anymore. Okay, so look, they're not that rude, but they are not wanting problem buildings anymore. Okay, because they also want to impress their reinsurers. Look at the quality of our book. Right, makes sense. And likewise, you know, AdSure, you know those claims ratios? Just by the way, to some degree, the insurance companies, they've got a summary of all of the claims ratios of all the buildings we insure, and then they say AdSure's claims ratio is running at 70%. So you can understand that a broker doesn't necessarily want a claims ratio running at 200% because it, if it, it, I won't say the insurance company necessarily has a dim view of that broker, but it just means there's something wrong with that broker's book <clears throat> of business. Okay. <clears throat> and I've always been quite proud about that, by the way. It's, a, it's quite a, an interesting fact. In the early days, I'm going back about 2008, 2007. They were our mid-years, by the way. They weren't our early years, but it's quite a long time ago, 2008, claims ratio became a big thing because at that stage in 2008, there was a huge spike in the price of steel, which affected building costs. I think the ratio, the, the, in 2008, I think the building rate went up by about 18%, if I remember, to 18%, if I remember correctly. And we were quite proud of the fact that we had been, because we had been encouraging um, our clients to have their buildings valued when it was not compulsory. We were encouraging valuations. Our books, um, we didn't get into, our clients didn't get into trouble because their ratios were right. Does that make sense? Not, not, not. I don't know what's going on out there, but I'm assuming everybody's nodding in agreement, not nodding off. Okay. That has become a big factor, point number four. So this is another big risk. You know what? I've always been scared of thatch. I grew up in Pinelands in Cape Town. And um, when I was, it must have been about 50 years ago when I was 12 or younger, maybe a little bit younger, I used to get on my bicycle because I heard my buddies used to say, Mike, there's a fire. Off we would fly off on our bicycles to go and watch a house in Eitflicht or Lynx Drive burn down. Because in Pinelands, most of the houses used to be thatch. If you drive down Forest Drive, there's still quite a few thatch houses, but you'll see most of them, you can see the style used to be thatch, and now they've got tiles on the roof. Okay, because thatch has always been a high risk, and I've always known it since I was a child. And hence, I've always been a little bit... I like thatch. I think that thatch picture you see on the right is a beautiful thatch building. I mean, actually, it almost doesn't... You can't, I, think, I actually think it's beautiful. It's beautifully done, even the windows, the way they're framed. Even the chimney matches nicely. But you won't catch me near a thatch building. And please don't, <laughs> we don't want on our books because it's a problem. Okay, now, um, sadly, thatch is very difficult to insure in South Africa at the moment. 
my understanding, and it is because we don't do thatch, but other brokers have told me and underwriters have told me that there's a company called Thatch Risk Acceptances that have been bought over by somebody else, and they had capacity to do thatch or reinsure with thatch, but now their wings have been severely clipped in these conditions. So you might, if you've got a thatch building and it's covered at the moment, just pray that it gets renewed nicely and you stay covered because apparently there's limitations per area. For example, if you're in Pinelands or Edenvale or Bloberg or somewhere and <clears throat> you, the, the capacity for that area by map uh, geographically is just say 10 million rand in Bloberg and now your building is 9 million rands worth of building and they've insured it. There's only a million rand left for somebody else. That seems to be the concept, if I'm understanding it correctly. I don't fully understand it, but that's generally. And I wanted to share that with you this morning because everybody's jumping around. It's no good coming to me with your thatch if your broker can't get you cover because I go to the same places. All right. Okay, now they used to under, so your insurance, Suntum or well, CIA or whoever would also have gone to the same underwriting manager too get the thatch part added to their policy and they share a premium, blah, blah, blah. Okay, thatch is a problem. Okay. Okay, my favorite subject, um, maintenance. Okay, this is uh, this is probably, I'm, I'm going to spend more time on it in a different seminar because it's a subject of its own. But what we're finding is that maintenance, lack of maintenance, it sounds so, uh, you know, every year we say the same thing, but it's really become a problem. Since COVID, budgets are so tight. Even in my own complex, the trustees are not wanting to increase the premium, um, increase the levy, and maintenance is costing. Okay. I actually have got even a video clip out, which very few people have actually watched, but it's called. Uh, see no evil, hear no evil, because people walk around um, and they, they're not, there's, there's loose paving, but everybody just carries on with their life. Nobody's saying to the body corporate, fix those pa that paving, you have to fix it. Nobody. It's just like, oh, I don't, I'm not a trustee, you know, and um, the trustees are saying, oh, we don't have money for it because people aren't paying their levies. Maintenance, 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 it has to happen. We had such a lovely, uh, seminar, Jolene Wasserman seminar on Saturday in Johannesburg. Zalinda was speaking and a few others. And there was a lady, Mauricia Robus, I think her, I'm saying her surname, uh, pronouncing it correctly, was excellent. I mean, she made the morning. She just breathed life into the morning. She had these pictures. And she's a maintenance specialist. And um, yeah, I'm meeting her for coffee on Friday. I can't wait. And we're going to be, to, be, she's going to certainly, I'm hoping that she will go out and bully some of my clients into doing their maintenance. Um, because stuff like cleaning a gutter, as you can see on the right, she's got some tremendous pictures of mushrooms and all sorts of things growing. Um, that, that gutter is going to overflow and it's going to flood into the section. And of course, uh, the owner is going to say, ah, but it's a sudden event, I must have a claim. And, the body, and then, you know, it's going to be excluded and then everybody's going to be crying and fighting and going to ombuds people. If somebody had just got up onto the gutters and cleared them. Um, I know Clive Reynolds is here this morning. We greeted this morning. Uh, Clive, um, make sure he's got a, an arrangement with a, a, a roofing guy and he goes out and cleans gutters once or twice a year. Clive, I think you've got a program like that. Not your head if you, I can't see you nodding. Um, and I, I really think that's the way to do it. Clive almost forces his clients, as far as I know, to do that. Um, that is something you need to really do. Um, paving, we've got a building. So we've got a building now where, well, we don't have a building now. I'm going to correct myself. So the, the trustees just didn't, they just wouldn't do stuff. I couldn't, I can't, I still can't believe this. It's actually one of my, things that have really irked me this this year so far. We warned the trustees that you're going to lose your cover if you don't fix the stuff. And the insurance company sent out a, a survey and they list a few things that needed to be done and they still didn't do it. And then they just ignored it. They said, oh, no, we'll do it after Christmas. We said, no, you must. And this has been going on. 
and uh, eventually the insurance company cancelled the policy just because the maintenance wasn't being done because it's a risk. Okay, if, I mean, in this building, I'm just going to think of a few things. The paving is broken down in the basement. Somebody slips and falls, that's a million rand, easy. The lights are, fittings are broken. No lighting, somebody slips and falls, that's a big liability claim. There should be handrails in certain places. It's not there. There's crumbling bricks lying around. There's gutters, big storm gutters that are blocked. And the list goes on. And it's not like it's going to be millions of rands to fix. It's just, oh, we don't care. And I think that's a big thing. If you can, uh, you know, I've got a new almost thing. I, I was watching uh, something the other day and a uh, uh, marketing thing. And it says, you should actually be telling your clients, not that you want them. You should be telling your clients what you don't want. You know, we don't want clients, trustees, clients that are, going to cut maintenance you, know, you, you I don't know how we could do that but it's almost what you need to do because maintenance is so important in reducing risk okay say no more uh, we've got the Narbers, we've got the Philip Nell engineers that we help us with some of these issues um, I'm hoping our new lady Mauricia Robas is going to help us uh, she's been on a lot of webinars before I know she was on WIST recently and then uh yeah, quite a few others um, uh, that are there. A project Lab, Cura Sure, you know, let them come in and help you. Okay, then number six and Fidelity. This one is new this week. Okay, so what's come to light is, you know, we don't, we only learn stuff as it happens. And, you know, we haven't had a real biggie. Uh, a managing agent uh, being dishonest and running away with a lot of money. And a lot of schemes were affected. Um, I think I can say the word proximity. Um, and lately, and uh, there's a huge outcry in Johannesburg because lots and lots of schemes are put in their claim uh, and the claim has been rejected. On Monday last month, not this Monday, the Monday before, um, a letter went out from one of the insurers to all of the bodies corporates that were affected that they were insuring saying, no cigar. Okay, so in a nutshell, I'm the, I've am the i got a copy of the letter. I was going to put it up and I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. But um, there are basically two reasons they've declined the claim. One, that a two-step process was not followed. So in other words, the naughty party, it seems, blocked everybody off from in their office. And so managing a naughty managing agent, nobody else can um, see their bank accounts. I'm controlling everything. So that was the first scenario. And the second thing is that person did not have a fidelity fund certificate, apparently. So those were the two main reasons. Now, this puts us all in a bit of a pickle. I'm talking about trustees, particularly, and managing agents. I don't have the solution this morning. I'm still trying to find it. I am engaging from my client's point of view so that we can start putting out some advice in terms of what can we do uh, best or how do we best approach this in future. So, because there are challenges. How does a husband and wife team, for example, who also shouldn't be letting, helping each other, you know, being the two-step process, et cetera, we need to overcome this challenge because I would rather have my my body corporate with a, a, a husband and wife team that are brilliant at their work than some large corporate where I don't know from one day to the next who my who's touching my money. Okay, so I'm just giving you that. Just you know, that's not please big schemes don't be, uh, big managing agents don't get me wrong. I'm just using an exaggerated example, but uh, the. The point that I'm making is that yeah, you know, the risk is not necessarily higher just because it's difficult to meet those requirements. In fact, it might be lower. So um, yeah, that's point one. Point two is um, how does a managing agent, oh, sorry, how does a trustee control what's happening inside the managing agent's office in terms of controls or et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, I mean, Mike Schaefer, Michael Schaefer and myself met last week to try and discuss this and 
played around with it. I have spoken to one or two of the insurers last week to try and get their feelings. In fact, I spoke to Shane from CIA, and CIA have done, even though they understand they are applying strict uh, criteria, you'll see that a lot of the underwriting questionnaires that come out now are quite onerous. Um, we're also trying to work a way of smoothing that over. We're using technologies to have like form full online so it's easier. And then, um, uh, you know, they, they have themselves been engaging with the um, a, a PBA to try and see, you know, what's the best way forward to protect everybody. Okay, so let's just say that it's an industry hot potato at the moment. And I'm hoping that I can come up with a, the best possible course of advice uh, for our clients moving forward here. Not yet resolved, but just be aware of the strictness. Two-step process and being registered. Whoever touches the money needs to be registered with the EAB validity fund certificate, etc. I don't want to get into that debate, but I am following it quite closely. Okay, I'm using the opportunity this morning um, to throw in number seven. This you might recognize if you've got very good memories, because even I had forgotten about this picture, uh, from a, a TVDM webinar. This is the exact slide that we did towards the end of last year, during before the holidays. Swimming pool gates. Okay, so I'm seeing this is a huge risk. Never mind 2024. It's been a big risk since, I don't know, since the Big Bang, um, the really gates, I, I just can't believe it. It's and more so in the up market schemes, high end EUA's exclusive use areas. Trustees think uh, it's an EUA, not my responsibility. Safety is um, just make sure that you're, you've got self locking gates. Um, I saw a brilliant one recently. I'm going to do a video on it. I've actually a little clip of just the gate. It's got like a magnet thing and everything, and the gate just closes uh, automatically. Um, yeah, please, gates at your swimming pools. Let's keep that tight. Right, very topical, lithium batteries. <laughs> Interesting. So the... There's there's a little bit of a debate going on in the background. So we, we've been recently very impressed by a certain type of fire extinguisher that's got gel in it. And you buy this thing, it's about two and a half, three grand. And you put this up next to your lithium battery so that one day when the lithium battery goes, this thing should put it out because apparently nothing puts lithium out, certainly not water. So... Um, my colleagues actually in Cape Town actually have got the because they've got inverters so they've got these things they very proudly said I can go buy one too because it's only fair that as a partner I can also have one and be the um, lo and behold I've just bought a new house myself and that picture on the right is my own uh, system okay believe it was there I was very lucky when I bought my house that it's there and I'm told because I had Glenn from Waterlight, who's an expert on these things, come and tell me, because I don't know what's going on with this technology. Apparently, that thing on the right there, that's my inverter, and that thing at the bottom in that box is my lithium battery. Okay, now these things, when they catch fire, they explode, and they blow up. So I was having Glenn look at this for me, and I was just saying, you know, is, is this okay? You know, is it safe? And is it good quality or is it rubbish? And I'm glad to hear that it's apparently very good quality. And I said to Glenn very proudly, I'm going to put a one of these extinguishers there because everybody's talking about these fancy extinguishers. And he said, actually, his advice to me is, if that thing is smoke coming out of that bottom box there, you run. You don't fiddle around with an extinguisher. You run. R-U-N. And then I thought, oh, let me phone my expert, Fire Ops. And I went to go and see Vanant Engelbrecht from Fire Ops. By the way, everybody should know who Vanant Engelbrecht from Fire Ops is. Maybe um, Zalinda and team, we should do a, a get. I think he's done one with you before. I'm not sure. Anyway, but definitely somebody that everybody should know. And uh, he said, run. No, he's not going to have a gel extinguisher on his vehicles. 
And if you really hate your wife, he said to me actually last week, then send her in with one of those fire extinguishers while you run. Okay, so I don't think anything at this point. <laughs> I'm, fire Ops is my man. He tells me I believe him. But, you know, other people are telling me that this fire gel thing is a good thing. Okay, so just know, I'm, I'm just putting it out there that they, it's not in casting concrete that this gel is the right thing and it's not casting concrete that it's the wrong thing. I don't know. So putting it out there, that's the risk in 2024 as far as lithium batteries go. Last year when we raised the question with the insurance companies because we were doing a lot of stuff on solar and I went to go and visit the insurance companies, I asked them, and when I said to them, these lithium batteries, what are you thinking about them? And they said, no, no, don't pick that scab, Mike. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. This year, they're all jumping around about lithium batteries because they've had fires. And now there's a debate about how do you protect it? Okay, so we don't have the answer for that one yet either. So we'll leave you in limbo on that. Watch the space when we do have a solution. Um, and um, let's see what's, what happens going forward. We don't know. I'm not saying Mike Addison didn't say, just take note I'm for the record. I did not say that those fire extinguishers are bad at all. I think they might, I might still go and buy one. Okay, I might still go and get one because I'd rather have something than nothing. That's my view at this point. Okay, then almost lastly, and I think this is lastly, on um, uh, storms. Um, so the higher excess is to be expected. Now that sounds like logical. Last year, a year ago, the, the one of the largest insurance companies in South Africa put up the storm excesses quite dramatically, 10% of claim, and I thought they were being rude. Um, and I almost said, you know, we're going to move all our business away type of thing. Not to them, but uh, <laughs> gradually over the year we'd move to the others because the excess, 10% of claim, minimum X amount or whatever the case might be, well, a year later, it looks like everybody's going that route. So just watch out. If you have, if you can get insurance with a lower storm excess going forward, it doesn't mean to say it's going to be like that for long. It can take 30 days for the insurance company to change their mind on your policy wording and your conditions. Storm excesses are going to be higher because storms have been hammering the whole world. And understandably, you can't. Ex the insurance companies will go out of business if they're going to pay for every bit of claim that comes off storms at the moment. On the 13th of November, I mean, we had about six huge buildings, millions of rands of damage in each in each building, one storm. Now, there's a whole lot of arguments. Should they be able to? Um, uh, should the insurance companies? Um, just double their premiums or should they manage it with higher excesses? So, yeah, that's also part of your good broking. I see Ian Sullivan has raised his hand. Do you want to, can I answer that? I suppose I can. Yeah, go yeah. for it. Ian, you can just unmute yourself quickly. <clears throat> it was only for the end of the meeting just to ask some questions, if I may. Oh, all right. Perfect. Perfect. Um, Mike, we do have only a couple of minutes left, so perhaps we can start wrapping this up. This is the last, this is the last point. This is cool, the last thank point. Thank you. There we go. Yeah. Hi, can I ask the question? Yeah, go Please for it. Do. Yeah, great. Hi. Thank you very much, Mike. I particularly found the claims ratio um, area of interest. Our broker's never shown us that, and I'm wondering whether they should have as a professional courtesy, but something we'll, we'll uh, look specifically. I wanted to ask on geezers. Uh, there seems to be a fixed price by all the insurance companies for how much you can claim for a geezer. I'm wondering if that's standard, whether that's a negotiable. We find in our building uh, the claim when people go and get their own geezer via a plumber, it's a lot more than the pricing offered the claim uh, amount um, and whether that's something we should negotiate. 
uh, in some buildings, it's more complicated to install a geyser, so it can't really be standard. I guess we've got to discuss, but I'd like a view. And the second area, which is, you know, you touched on relating to uh, the fire extinguishers. We put in a, an inverter. We were told that we had to have a, um, uh, a different uh, extinguisher. But in general, extinguishers is a bit of a hot topic at the moment. Our, we get our extinguishers serviced every year. We're now told there's a new standard for extinguishers. And in order for the building to be properly insured, we have to conform with a new standard where there's a huge extra cost. And we'd like, obviously, we're going to look around, get other views, but whether how we speak to our insurance company about getting some kind of guide to be sure we covered, because the one thing we don't ever want to find is there's an issue and we find for some obscure rule, we're not covered. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, um, Zalinda, it's 11.01. Are we for answering questions? I'll just you answer can, these you two. You can take five minutes or so, Mike. That's okay. perfect. Thank you. Okay. So the, the geezer question, first of all, um, the yes, absolutely. So the short answer is yes, you can. Your your Some insurance companies are a little bit more static, but uh, the insurance companies we work with or willing to work with, we want them to be able to increase um the the limits we call them geezer limits the insurance companies um are doing the insurance are, are saying for example we will do your geezer let's just say for up to 10,000 rand geezer limit if it's a 150 liter geezer 10,000 rand but now you as you say your plumber comes along but he's going to do it properly and he's going to charge 13 or 11 and a half so there's a shortfall and then the owner has a shortfall and then we have a big fight blah 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 now, very simple. If your plumber is charging 11 and a half because of this reason and that reason, you go to the insurance company, what will the premium be if we increase that to 11 and a half? Simple. And we do that. Okay. So not always, but sometimes. Um, when I say it sounds contradictory, but there are instances, and it's otherwise it's a 15 minute answer. So I'm just doing a short answer here is if the claims ratio is high, the insurance company, for example, might give you an extra premium, which is a little bit too high. But by and large, if you increase the premium from, say, 10,000 to 11 and a half, you're going to pay an extra maybe 20 rand a, a, a section, and, and there you have it, and it's covered. Um, again, if you use a call center, the call centers negotiate um, with plumbing groups because now we're talking volume. The plumbers have got teams, they're going out, they, they've, they're they almost like, you know, Formula One team work around a geezer and they zoot out there and they do geezers and they do perhaps more per hour, uh, more work per hour than the standard plumber that does it once a month. And they also um, uh, have negotiated better terms for purchasing. They've got better discounts at the suppliers. Uh, for example, I mean, Waterlight, for example, manufacture geysers. So you can imagine they can get parts at good prices. And this all comes down, uh, is passed on to the consumer in some ways. Uh, by way of using the call center, we all win-win. That's, that's the answer there. And then what we do, just to share some of our, which I had had, actually hadn't gone public with because, you know, it's one of our differentiating advice factors is we are encouraging Azure clients to go stainless steel where possible because we believe, and we've proven it now, I like to test things for a good five years, six years now, and uh, the stainless steel geyser costs 13,000 Rand for a fully installed for a 150 at present, uh, fully installed. And so we increase our clients' uh, uh, limits to 13,000 Rand, we pay a little bit of extra premium, we put it to the trustees, it'll cost X amount. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I went to a, <laughs> an AGM the other day in, uh, in Johannesburg, and I was selling this concept, but it was too high, it was an extra 30 Rand a unit or something, uh, and they didn't buy it. But it depends. Um, so I'm not saying it's, it fits all, but in many instances you can. One of our underwriters at the moment like the stainless steel so much that they are increasing the limit as long as the, the claims ratio 
is good and within range, then they're prepared to actually get, throw it in at no extra cost. Okay, so some of the underwriting managers are much more progressive with their thinking, and it takes it's taken us five years, six years to educate them. Um, so there's a long answer for you. <laughs> okay, on the fire extinguishers, um, fire ops. Fire ops, SA, uh, Vaynant Engelbrecht. There are others, but he's my man. Okay, I have a problem. I phone Vanant. Um, Vanant, what's going on with these lithium batteries? Vanant, I've got I've got a fire and uh, there's a dispute. Can you give us an engineer, please? And he, they've, it's a private fire station. He is Mr. Fire Expert. He's a chief. Uh, he was a fire chief. Uh, yeah, he's your man. Contact him and ask him all of your questions. Thanks so Thank much, Mike. Mike. I've actually shared... Um, the three articles that Vaynant did for us, he did a series for us, and I've okay. also shared his website details and his contact details. Mike, before we get going, perhaps you want to, and I've shared your details already, but do you want to give the viewers any information about your Aton system? Uh, okay. Um, yeah, we've got we've got a system which we've been building since 2014, as many of you know, a lot of you enjoy. Um where a managing agent can log in and track claims. From your point of view, that's just the helpful part. You know, it's all very well to tell you all about our fancy system internally, but externally, you can log in, track your claims live. I think lots of you do. You can see all your, you know, you don't have to phone us for a list of your clients. You can quickly go there, download a spreadsheet even, or a PDF, whatever version you want. Blah, 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 it does a few things. So you can log in. But what we're doing is we're enhancing it now is that even when you go into it, the, uh, you go past a whole lot of resources. Online claims, you can you can submit, you don't have to get a PDF, fill it. even a form full PDF is old fashioned in our view. Um, you can do a step, 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 uh, fill in a claim, submit a claim, blah, blah, blah. Lots of other resources. Booklets. We're trying to do e-booklets on almost every subject. There's stuff on uh, stainless steel geysers. Um, yeah, go and have a look. Um, if you just go to our web page, and on the top right-hand corner, there's an um, an Aton button you, where you would normally log in. Aton login. Just press the Aton login button if even if you're not a member. And there's already a whole lot of resources for you to go and scratch around and play with. Fantastic. Okay. Thanks, Mike. I shared that link as well um, in the chat. Just a reminder for everybody that we will post the recording as well as a copy of the slides and all the links that Mike mentioned on our website within the next couple of days, earliest um, probably next week. So if you do have any um, need to go and listen to this again, please do. I've also shared the details of Mike's YouTube channel where he keeps all of these um, really resourceful uh, short clips. Um, I, I personally prefer the 30-minute call with Mike as opposed to the YouTube videos, um, but I know that not everybody has all the time, all, all time, all the time. So Mike, from us, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. We had a really great turnout today, really good registrations, and I'm sure that we will have a chat with you again in the near future. Thank you for the references to all of our great colleagues in the industry. Um, of course, for those of you that attend our webinars often, you would have seen them online. For those of you that need anybody's contact information, you know where to find us and we will connect you um, with, uh, with much happiness in that regard. Ladies and gents, have a lovely week further. Thank you again, Mike, for your time. Um, and we'll see you again in our next webinar next month. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.